with that. And I would like to thank everybody real quick before I kick it over to Brian. Thanks for attending this second session, one of two. There may be some folks on here. It's their first time on this session. Um, don't worry about that. I'll walk you through it. We will have access to the videos for the first class. Um, but this is a really important class of, the, of everything that we talk about. And um, with that, um, I'll, I'll give you a lot more explanation later. But I'll turn it over to Brian Young with uh, York College SBDC. And thanks, thanks to he and uh, Harry Wells for uh, getting this all put together for us, as long as Julius Shaw. So I'll go to the next slide there, Brian. <laughs> with their agenda for tonight. Hey, thank you, Brian, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to let Harry uh, introduce one of our guests tonight. Uh, so Harry will, uh, will introduce me. Harry? Hello, Wells. I work with this. I work for the York College SPDC. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't join you for the last session because I was in Texas attending a family, uh, family funeral. Um, uh, I would like to introduce Ms. Patricia Nia Rock. She works with Bank United. Uh, Bank United is the one who gave us the funds so we could facilitate this workshop. Nia's had uh, decades of experience working in banking. Uh, she does a lot of work with taking bank money and, and doing community investment uh, projects. She has a long experience in Southeast Queens. She worked with Greater Jamaica, elected officials, and other people to facilitate affordable housing uh, in Southeast Queens back, it must have been 20, 25 years ago. Uh, so we call Nia, Ms. Nia Rock the banker's banker. And we thank you for the first fund, uh, funding that you gave us. And we thank you for the present funding. And uh, I'll, please, please uh, introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Harry, for that wonderful introduction. But I am getting so much out of the, the workshop. Last last time around, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian, for delivering such a wonderful uh, the, uh, set of, of information and data for our um, small businesses throughout New York and in Southeast Queens. We're really excited at Bank United to um, be able to support the program. And we look forward to being able to do that in the future. So um, thank you. And uh, not to take up too much time, I really want to wish all the small businesses that are participating well and look forward to hearing about the wonderful things that you're going to be doing once you introduce your business plans. Thanks again. Thank you, Nia. Thank so you. Good, good evening, everyone. Again, thank you for joining us for this webinar on small business uh, planning um, named Business Plan Express, provide, powered by Live Plan, co-sponsored by the New York State Senator Leroy Camry, and the financial support of Nia Rock from Bank United. I am a business advisor with the York College SBDC the Small Business Development Center. We are located in Jamaica, Queens to serve this local community. We provide small business owners in New York with the highest quality and confidential business counseling at no cost to you. Some of our services include business startup, MWBE certification, import and export, financing, and e-commerce. You can also visit you can also visit our YouTube channel, SBDC YouTube channel, to watch previously recorded workshops on different topics like e-commerce, Shopify, LinkedIn, and more. Uh, the staff at the SBDC at your college include Harry Wells, Brian Tapp, Brandon Deal. Joshua, Mickey, Paula Bianco, Josh, Julia Shaw, um, 
Oswaldo, Rangifo, Lewis, Scamadella. Um, and for tonight, our live planning instructor is Brian Tapp. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Um, we'll go through tonight and uh, looking forward to it. Uh, we'll give you a little background coming up. Um, this is a second of two, a series of two sessions. If this is your first session on session two, don't worry. Tonight, we'll talk, talk a lot about financial benchmarking. You can uh, watch the other, uh, the first session, which talks a lot about the pitch, the company, the milestones of how to use the software. For those folks that are new tonight, I will be sending you out access to the software for your to work on your lean business plan model. Um, you'll probably get that uh, tomorrow. And um, also I'll follow up with some additional supporting documentation with that. So again, welcome to everyone. It's great to see everybody. I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled in case anybody else jumps in and um, kind of going uh, through the, the group of folks that we have uh, overall. Um, I'll, I'll also, at, toward the end, Brian will do a, a follow-up and a closing. Um, with that, I will say for those existing businesses that were in session one, um, I, we did see that quite a few have signed up for SBDC services, the same with the second session. Folks that just jumped on, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how to sign up for SBDC services that Brian mentioned with that as well. So I'm gonna get started. I don't wanna, I don't wanna overuse the term, but tonight I'm gonna to talk a lot about financial benchmarking. So feel free to ask any questions in the chat and um, we can kind of go through that. I'll try to get through as much as I can within the time period. But really um, in my career, working in, with small businesses for quite a, quite a few years, this, is, this session is so important for people to look at the profitability and the financial projections of where they're going to succeed at. So um, I think it's, it's really valuable. And again, um, if you don't understand a concept or need more clarification, don't hesitate to initially put it in chat. If not, I see Hector's pretty good with the uh, reaction sector. So if you want to raise your hand um, through the reactions, you can do that as well. So um, we'll try to answer those. But we'll try to get through it. Um, one second here. Let's make sure... Got everybody oh, that is not here. before I go. All right, he's almost back. Don't so, make any noise. The baby's sleeping. During the Ryan, can, can you mute? Yep, I will. Huh? Finish your ice cream. Okay, I was going to go through and just say if everybody could just stay muted when you're not speaking. Um, you can also your choice for video. It's nice to see folks put a name to a face, a face to a name for me. So Tehran, it's good to see you. I, I mean, I've communicated back and forth with you as well. So um, kind of going through that, if it's your choice. If you'd like to ask a question, as I mentioned, you can also use a chat function. And this presentation will be available online with PowerPoint and we'll be uh, doing a little bit of edit on the video um, with that as well. So we'll have that uh, prepared for you in a couple of days if you wanna go back and look at this. But I would say one thing tonight, and I'll also show you some additional files that will be beneficial as you put those financial projections together, other resources. So with Julia's help, we'll submit all those PDFs to either a box or access to for folks to use or to get to pull that data sets uh, from them. So that's okay. Julia, give me a heads up or thumbs up if that works for you. So, yep, that's good. It works. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm, a, I'm Brian Tapp, a live plan expert. I've been using live plan since 2013. I'm going to go through a few of the slides that I did last time for the new people, just so they get a familiarity of where we're headed with this. So again, this class is really set up for um, entry level, considering where you want to go with the business plan. And that's what I'm here to, to try to instruct and also facilitate tonight uh, with the SBDC at your college. I was an SBA loan officer at NEA, if you can appreciate that. I've primarily worked with uh, Small businesses, probably anywhere from twenty-five dollars to one hundred fifty thousand dollars loans. Did some higher up, higher end stuff though as well. I've also managed revolving loan funds or community funds um, as well. I have a background in economics. Um, I always like to do a little bit. I kind of a stoic philosophy guy, but um, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to to it that matters. So if something happens to you in your business as you're going through it, just how you react to it could you know make or break what you're doing. So think it through um, as you're going through that. So that Epictetus. Uh, stated that. So this class uh, is an overview of life plan. 
We're, we've already discussed some tools available for the lean business model. The last time we talked about the pitch, the company, the milestones. Tonight, we're going to talk about projections. And um, as the SBDC advisors know, and those folks like uh, Mia, yourself, uh, uh, Julia, yourself, a lot of folks like to do the first three sections, but they get a little hesitant with, with the forecast. I'm going to try to make that as easy as possible uh, for you and, um, and, and, and really try to show you yeah, and get more familiarity with the numbers and really provide some realistic projections if you are going to be pursuing um, funding through uh, a wide range of either investors, loans, or small business loans, whatever it may be, or even, even like um, trying to secure funds through your family uh, with that. So again, financial benchmarking and profitability is what we're going to be focusing on. If you have not signed up for SPDC services, I would encourage you, strongly encourage you tonight to do so. Um, as you can see, there's a hyperlink here that you can um, go to. And um, maybe Brian, during this, you can type in that hyperlink and put it in the chat for people to link to. Um, that would be great if you get a chance to do that. Um, what we'd like you to do is schedule. You need to go down and click schedule an appointment right here. And then it will walk you right through uh, the next uh, place to make an appointment right here. So again, schedule and then you need to make an appointment. And what that does, it actually gets you into these free services through the SBC at your college. And they, like Brian mentioned, a wide range of different services they can provide you if you have not signed up for them. We, again, this is sponsored by uh, United Bank and also SBDC. So again, we need to track and make sure that we're really helping the best that we can. So when you're in that system, it really does provide a, uh, uh, a good, a good um, uh, recipe for that success. Now, the other thing too, when you get down into this next page, this is a highlight. Um, just make sure that you select um, the County Queens, make sure you select York College SBDC, and also make sure that you put in this page right here that you're putting right here, Queens, your, uh, Queens York SBDC, and then also Live Plan Business Assistance is what you're looking for. Not that you're only asking for that, but that kind of helps put them in in a range of what assistance that you can provide. So again, going through and signing up for those services are, uh, is extremely important for them to track and also long-term commitment with, with you as a client. So, so with that being said, with that commercial, the number one uh, homework for today is so far, sign up for those services. And then we're gonna talk about some other homework down at the end, try to make it as easy as possible. But again, there'll be a little bit of work to be doing. So. What is LivePlan? LivePlan is a cloud-based software. I do know that over, I think there were, the first uh, session, there were like 18 people. I do think that uh, 13 of the eight, no, uh, 12 of the 18 uh, signed into LivePlan. If you have not, and I sent you a link and you have problems with it or did not get the link, I will make sure that you get that again. I Just send me a, send Brian a quick email. His contact information will be at the end. Send him an email. I think Tehran, I'm looking at you, but I think you've already signed up and logged in. Julia, you have. Um, a lot of other folks, Aliyah, I think you have as well, just off the top of my head. So if you have not, um, please, please do that. So LivePlan, again, is an a online tool, cloud-based. You can add contributors, which I did. I put the accounts. I tried to put your names in there, and I added you to that. So you can also add Brian Young to that um, or Oswaldo if you're working with one of those two, uh, two gentlemen with that. Um, you can also fully publish the plan upon completion. I'm going to show you that tonight um, as well. So what is a lean model? We're, this class, there is a follow-up class that actually is, um, it, it will be January 12th, which is Harry's birthday, but it's, um, it's a class that will be a 10-week class that will really be focused on a fully vetted business plan. In this class, we're focusing on a lean model, which is really, deter, really um, set up to determine is it a go or no go for your business? Like, are you thinking about it or you're starting it, but you need some more information? So this is a lean model where, again, we're gonna talk about the pitch company milestones we talked last time and then the forecast. And what this does, it reduces your time commitment for overall exploration. If you are gonna to go to like a Miss Rock at, uh, at the bank, you know, she may, she may or may not require you for a full business plan, but this is a good start to start the conversation to see like, where they may be at or, or someone like that or involving on fund, where they may be at and what information do they need to follow up with. And the significance of a business plan, a lot of folks ask the question like, why do I have to put one together? To make it really succinct, you're taking what's here, 
what you think you know about the business and what you do know about it, and you're putting it down for someone else to read or review that. So that will help provide good information, what you're trying to do, where you're trying to grow, go, how you're trying to grow, and then what, what your team look like overall. So I have some key points there. Again, you can look at this at your leisure. Um, again, it talks at the very bottom about what, who, how, um, for anybody who's looking to just invest or uh, someone somewhere. So tonight I'm going to make it pretty simple. I know that no, I don't think anybody's doing this. I do know that somebody's doing, a couple of people are doing restaurants, but what I wanted to talk about tonight with this coffee shop example is really to go through the methodology of how to collect data, how to collect information and um, uh, with that. So kind of looking at that whole process. When I did send out to the first session, the folks that did get the information, you notice in my email, I did, I did state that it may not be exact. And I'm gonna pick out, sorry, Teron, I'm gonna pick, I hope I didn't say, say your name correctly. But I'm gonna pick you a little bit because it's not gonna be exactly perfect on what you're trying to do, but it's gonna give you a ballpark, right? So I think you put like student driving, truck driving school, yeah, it's what you're looking at, different things for buses. So it may not be exactly the correct, perfect thing, but it's giving you a ballpark with the numbers that I submitted to you. So is that correct? Yep, cool, thanks. And so the same thing tonight, so that's what I'm looking at with the coffee shop. So a coffee shop, we look down at the bottom of the, the page here and it says NICS, and that will be um, that will be the NAICS code. So it's uh, North American Industrial Classification System. And the number, everybody gets a number. I think, um, um, Hector, maybe you've received it. Some other folks, you'll get a six digit number, maybe a five, maybe a four you'll get a number that I submit out to you guys, or you may have selected it yourself. So in this case, coffee shops, as you can see, are 722515. Why is that important? That starts putting me into you into a comparison of when you're starting to work on these financials, that you're doing some comparisons of what does it look like. Net profit margin, what's your cost of goods? What's your cost of equipment? What does so maybe some depreciation look like? But just the basics with that. So when we're looking at the coffee shop overall, and this can be on a lot of things, whether it's consulting, whether it's um, I'm looking at, I think, Aliyah, I think you're, you're looking at some perfumery stuff, um, but just some different, different processes with that. What, is the, what are the, some of the business considerations? Well, with a coffee shop type of operation, what are some brand names that you may sell or you may be competing against? What are some products location? Uh, leasing space is a good location. What, what are the type of employment you may be having? What's the marketing strategy for that? And also what's the exit strategy? So for, it doesn't matter what the business is, but those are some key things to consider with anything that you're doing is what, the, what does that look like? So again, going on to the next slide here, whoops. Um, and then what are the profit drivers? In coffee shops, growing trust, customer traffic, what's your hours of operation? For example, some folks in coffee shops may say, I'm going to be open from five o'clock in the morning till 2 p.m. and then I'm going to be done, right? Some may say, well, hey, I'm going to have open mic night. I'm going to be from five o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. So I'm going to need more people during those time frames. So again, hours of operation are important with retail. Um, average orders, managing labor costs, improving gross margin. And one thing that's important with anything that you're talking about retail, food service, catering, Anything with that is seasonality. What does the seasonality look like? Good example would be um, uh, steakhouses. So I did some research on steakhouses uh, probably the last year uh, through the Federal Reserve of all places that had uh, steakhouse seasonality. And it's not seasoning, it's seasonality when they're selling the most per month. And actually May is the top month for selling steaks. During the season, you would think like summer, you'd think like they'd sell more. No, because people are barbecuing more. So then it slows down, then it starts picking back up in the fall um, through the holidays. So again, looking at seasonality for coffee shops, kind of the same thing. You, you got to really look at, look at uh, what's going on with that. I think one other thing I'll mention too here on this little chart, in some of the data sets that I use, you'll, you'll get this pie chart and it'll show you like where, what are people doing for revenue? And this one, I'll just do a couple. Food on premises, 35%. Beverages, 17%. Food, 14 On premises. Beverages via drive-through, 10%. It can also depend upon 
what city you live in? Is there an accessibility for a drive through Or is it really just neighborhood coffee shop? Walk to or, or things like that. Uh, food via drive through 8%. Beverages on off premises, 9%, which surprised me, but then other. Um, so people take it to go. Other is 7%. So again, this kind of gives you an idea. We're starting to put the macro level together of what's going on with coffee shops and snack bars with that. So some of the industry trends um, that we look at too when we're putting these numbers together and again in a coffee shop is where what's the history? What's been going on with wholesale pricing, right? Um, what, what also has been going on with snacking? What, what other integrations have there been? So today I went on the most recent data I could pull and say, what's going on in industry trends in coffee shops, right? Well, um, these are the things that I've found. There's been a, a shift and it seems like in my career, it's been cyclical with frozen yogurt, but frozen yogurt's back again, right? And so if you look at the integration with that um, in some of these coffee shops, down at the bottom, you see like um, that 42% of consumers reported in the last two years, they're snacking three or more times per day and growing number are snacking five times. I think COVID's got me into five times per day myself personally, but to really look at that, that, um, that process of what's going on with people. Um, Technology is also important with coffee shops, online ordering, and then upselling. I don't know, show of hands, but anybody goes to the coffee shop, I'm just a black coffee drinker. I don't put anything in it, but they're not going to make money off me. What they make money off of is those folks who are going to be like, I'm going to guess Harry, who's going to say, well, I need to have two shots of espresso, and I need this, this, and this added to it. Well, Harry's going from $3 a cup to about 6 bucks a cup, right? So again, looking at upselling with with the coffee side of that. Hopefully that was not, am I correct, Harry? Are you close with that? Or do you like black coffee? Good. The other thing we like to look at is industry risks. Risks, And this could be, again, I'm basing it off of this, but this could be specifically to your uh, business. Sensitivity to economic risk. What are some of the variable supply costs? As we know, um, I know I don't mean to pick on different people, but um, looking at this, uh, again, Tehran's looking at um, people driving, vehicle costs have went up substantially, especially used car vehicles, used vehicles in the last uh, year, year and a half, as far as costs go. But looking at variable supply costs, competition from alternatives, and in, in this case, food safety too is very important for coffee shops to make sure they can maintain and retain that possibility. So um, although coffee shops are less vulnerable to recession and in other industries, they're impacted by economic downturns. People have less disposable income. They may start trying to cut back on that $6 coffee and say, I might try something else or make it at home. Uh, who knows with that? The other thing too that we look at, and this would be in a report that I do, I'll show you a cover of it. Some folks may have got it, but it's vertical IQ is what I use. It's a software package and I can make sure the folks that don't have that, well, I'll try to do the best job I can to get you a copy of that. But, we we'll also do. We we'll also provide you some credit underwriting things from what a bank's perspective would look at, and so business exit rates, cyclical sensitivity, barriers to entry are important. Um, external risk, what the industry outlook is, and financial summary. So again, they'll look at this from a risk perspective. If you're going into it, let's say that you're a construction company and you have to have tons of equipment, it may be more of a risk in some cases than it would be for a small retail establishment, just bang, betting upon what you're trying to sell. So again, looking at the overall risk with your business helps put together some of this financial benchmarking data sets with that. One thing on, for the consulting folks that may be on, on the, the, the webinar tonight, one thing that may be important for a risk for you folks would be like over committing the projects that you can't complete. So for example, if we say like, I can do these types of projects and I'm really good at it, um, but I can't really keep up because I'm overcommitted to the number of projects. That may be a deterrent for you long-term. It's kind of like um, uh, maybe you've done too much marketing, you got, you're too good at what you do. You may have to start saying no, and unless you can up staff, add, add more staff, or you can be, figure out ways to be more efficient. So just some thoughts with that industry risk, risk with other folks with this.
So that's over from industry. From the company risk, that would be your specific company maybe competing with franchises, coffee. Let's say they have to compete with Duncan. I know this in that lower, uh, greater Jamaica area. Tons of Duncan, Duncan locations around that area. Just pulling up a Google map. Um, what, how are you competing with them? Um, what about your franchise or franchisee? If you're looking at some kind of agreement with that, what does that look like? And then also the location. What if something's happening in the location around you where the accessibility is limited or you can't have access to the store or you, you're going to outgrow your facility because your construction equipment just isn't in the right spot? That's, that's also something to really consider. Again, I have a little quote at the bottom, but with limited resources, small operators must depend on differentiated products or superior customer service to su survive, right? So you're not basing your, a small business may not just be basing their business model on lowest price. If you're gonna do that, at some point, you're, the larger, the larger competition is probably gonna, probably gonna push you out if, you, if you're just focused on that. So it's really important to depend upon your customer, customer service, excel at that, and some unique niche products that you may be selling. I think, Leah, I think I'm thinking about you and maybe I'm incorrect, but you know, if you're looking at different products with the perfumery uh, type things, or I'm gonna say cosmetics, health and beauty, you know, do you have different things that really are unique with that, um, that process? So again, hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm tying it all together with that. So just so folks know. The other thing uh, that we that we look at is the working capital side, um, and how how are you going to finance your operation? What does it look like, and how are you going to manage it? This, if we want to take a little pause, and we'll talk a lot about this slide. One of the things with working capital is how are you selling and invoicing? You may be really good at selling your product. You may be really good at securing contracts but you're terrible at following through on invoicing people or charging people, right? It just happens, right? Um, so how are you gonna do that and how are you gonna collect with that? And then also to consider is how are you gonna manage cash? What type of system are you gonna set up? Is it gonna be just basic QuickBooks, which would be fine? Is it gonna be something else? Um, de depending upon what you're, you're trying to accomplish and how large you're trying to become with the business. How are you gonna pay? pay your employees. And ultimately, I always say this, how are you going to pay yourself? Because if you're not paying yourself, then why are you doing what you're doing? Because isn't that the whole focus is to pay yourself? I can't tell you, and I, I'm sure uh, Harry's, Harry's live on here, he nodded his head, but how many people that we work with, Harry, that don't pay themselves? And they start out with a good intention, but then two years down the road, they're still not paying themselves, right? So you got to make sure that you're looking at that with the capital of how are you managing that um, from that perspective and how you're paying yourself. And then also reporting um, back, whether you have investors, whether you have the bank, are you providing them quarterly financials, annual financials, if they are asking for any tax returns, are you making sure that you provide good information, right? So I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I also work with a guy who did um, a vending business. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be funny here. So I know you're all muted, but his... He'd come to the, I used to, when I was an SBA lender, he was my client and he used to drive a van and the license plate would say quarters on his license plate, right? So it always made me laugh. And he'd come in there and he'd make deposits all the time with all this change. And, and we would go through it. He'd look to expand. And then he, he uh, did like a, a food, ven, food, uh, food route with um, vending machines. And then he got into a, a couple of laundromats. And so he had change going all the time. And I said, I'll never forget this. I said, Larry, how, how many buckets of quarters do you have in your basement? Like five gallon buckets of quarters do you have in your basement? He's like, well, how do you know? I'm like, I just know. I just know you, you probably have quarter, five gallon. He's like, well, I got 50 of them right now. And I'm like, Larry, you need to report that and deposit that in the bank because that can also go through your, your financial statements to show if you ever want to sell that you're more profitable than what you're showing because you're making the deposits, you're incurring those in QuickBooks and the whole thing. Does everybody follow what I'm saying here? So that could hurt him long-term if he was not reporting all of his, you know, all of his earnings with that. And so I think I might've got him down to 30, 30 buckets, five gallon buckets, but, um, and Neil, you know what I'm saying? I say you're back on. It makes a lot of sense to do that full reporting with that. So 
Here's one thing on this red little box over here. I pulled this off of um, a couple of sites that I went and pursued, just dig, do a little more digging on these coffee shops. And um, this is on eating and drinking establishments. Where do people go for technical assistance or financial assistance or advice overall? And so 43% go to an accountant. That's good. 11% go to their banker. That's pretty good. Although a lot of times banks don't want to give you personal financial or business financial advice because they don't want the liability with that. 11% may go to an industry partner. So if, I'm, if I sell coffee, I may go talk to a coffee roaster who works with 10 different coffee shops and he may give me a, he or she may give me some, some insight on that. But the last one is 51% do not seek advice, right? When I first put this together, I thought 51%. I mean, that's a lot. That, that's a lot of people that either, and, I, and I, I'm trying to be super cheerleader about this. Um, I don't have any pom-poms, but I would say this. If you, can, if you don't like to do that type of work on the financials, it's okay. Go get a bookkeeper. Go get an accountant. Talk to somebody, right? Go through that process so you really can really can put together a good picture of what those financials look like, okay? And I would say this right now, overall, of all the people that I work with, um, that I work with, and Harry may have a different uh, uh, process with this, um, I would say 90% of the people don't like the financial side and 10% do, right? So it's okay. I mean, if you don't like it, find somebody who does that can help you succeed because I, again, sorry, Nia. Nia's going to like you. Harry's going to like you. Your investors are going to like you. Your family's going to like you. Like everybody's going to be like, yeah, you got a good, good handle on this. And it's worth it to budget up front when you're doing projections to really, if you don't want to, do that consulting fee and pay however much a month to do that. One thing I do like to say, and again, I'm trying to be funny, but if you say, if Harry comes to me and I'm advising him or coaching him and I say, Harry, who's doing your financials? And Harry tells me my brother's sister's cousin's uncle's nephew is going to do them for me. Right. And, and I, and I see Nia smiling because she's heard this too. That's a bad answer, right? Because that nephew is never going to show up unless you're paying him typically, or he's got some ownership into the, into the business. Right. And so it's really important to make sure that you've got the right person doing it. I can't tell you how many husband and wives I work with where the, the husband was going to do the financials. And guess what? Never did it. Never got to it. Didn't have time. And then we're trying to, we're trying to figure out workout or working capital down the road uh, for that startup um, looking at that. So um, overall, so again, something to keep in mind, not trying to be, I'm trying to be a cheerleader to say it's a positive thing to think about this. And um, it's okay. Um, it's okay to go get some, uh, some outside advice. Um, and some people may say, well, I should be able to know everything. Well, do what you're good at and let the people that can help you be better at what you're good at. That, that's gonna show some success with that. Overall cash management two challenges. So seasonality, I talked about that. So I'll get more definitive with coffee shops. So coffee shops um, do, you'll, you'll know this, they do really well starting in August again. And every month you see them climbing, September, October, November, December, they're rocking it out. People have more free time doing more visiting potentially. And again, post COVID. January, they drop back off a little bit. And then February, they start climbing back up till about April. And then um, May through June, July, August, you don't really see, you don't see that, that continued growth. You see it static or dropping off, right? So you have to manage your people and you have to manage your cash flow. So it's extremely important. And the, like this quote here, the demand for coffee can be seasonal. It is seasonal. New product offerings in the summer, like they're offering cold brew, right? Different things with cold brew. They may be integrating frozen yogurt into the mix to generate some more revenue during those, um, those off-peak um, seasonal time. So again, looking at that cash management and this chart I pulled from the Federal Reserve out of, uh, oh, it's actually the St. Louis, the Fed. I, I was just searching for things and I came across this for average price of coffee. 
And you're like, why would you pull that off? Well, I'm just kind of curious of what coffee prices have done over since 1985. Not that I really need to know what happened in 85, but I'm looking at the peak from 2010 from the recession recovery and look what coffee prices did around 2013. They were sky high compared to where they're at now. If you see the gray line right here over here, you're seeing 2020. They're going back up a little bit, but they were at their peak there. What does that tell me? I may need to charge more um, during during certain time peak. I may have to have some flexible pricing going on with um, with what with my products. So again, looking at that. And when I'm looking at capital financing, kind of going through some of these things, I mentioned early on at the last session, I put it in the PowerPoint before, when you're looking at financing, you're going to secure some sources and uses of funds. In this case, we said that we needed this model, we're saying we need a loan for $250,000 for equipment. We're gonna lease a space. We're gonna need to make some leasehold improvements, and hopefully roll those back part of those back to the, the landlord. It's just gonna depend on where, what our location is. But we also like to put examples of equipment. And I mentioned this before, but again, when you can show and pull that pricing together of what you need for your business, what you may be needing, whether it's supplies for bottling something, for packaging, for um, equipment, for technology. I see Mr. Clay Haynes on here. Technology, artistic stuff. What do you need for that, right? So again, if you can put like I have over here, I've got a commercial espresso machine. I jokingly said last time, one lady I worked with said that she was just going to buy five Mr. Coffees. And that's how she was going to make coffee. And I'm like, that's probably a no-go. Let's figure out where you want to go with this. Or if you want to own the business and hire a barista, that may be an option for you, right? Somebody who really knows the business. So again, looking at commercial espresso machine, Nothing against Mr. Coffee's, by the way. I have one, but I'm just saying, looking at that. Turbo Chef Quick cook, Cooker, in case you're doing some quick some quick food, some pastries, some baked goods, um, quick sandwiches, something like that. Soft serve uh, ice cream or yogurt machine. And then maybe if you need a walk-in cooler. There. So what that's doing is it's showing whether it's a revolving loan fund, a lender, investor. What are you thinking about doing with your capital finance? Well, I need to buy... This equipment, and at the high end, my equipment's going to cost me $25,000, uh, $43,000 just for this section here. Um, and maybe I have quotes for the leasehold improvements that I'm putting in there too. But again, projects that require capital funding may include building, equipment, fixtures, technology, information systems, and in some cases, working capital. You, you may need to look at some working capital to get you rolling when you're, you're uh, focused on um, you're focused on the business startup with that. I did a lot of working capital uh, early on with a lot of small businesses. And it, that I put working capital in. And one thing that people forget about too, when they're planning their business is signage. Like they always forget like, oh yeah, if it's retail, I need a sign. Or in the case of a like, uh, um, again, I'm picking on Tehran tonight. You only one now, Tehran. Um, he's going to do signage for his vehicles, right? Or his driving school or anything like that. He's going to pay for, for wraps or signage. Always remember to keep that in mind of what are your total costs. And if you're not comfortable with it, go talk to, go talk to um, your business advisor at SBC, talk to, talk to your lender or your you know, investors, or talk to your core group of people. Make sure you don't forget something. That happened a few times, and I learned really quickly after about the third time Make sure I ask all my clients, did you have money in there for signage? Because signs, anybody who's bought signs know they're not cheap. Um, they're not, if, you, if you're really looking at making something nice, so. Make sure I didn't miss something there. So tonight, I'm gonna take a quick, quick uh, break here for about a minute, I don't know, 30 seconds. And then I'm going to talk about benchmarking. So if anybody's got something they want to drink, I'm going to take a drink of coffee here real quick and then go through this benchmarking with you folks and explain what it's all about. Mm -hmm. 
Hector, if you can give me a thumbs up, you received some of the benchmarking information that I sent you. You're correct, right? Am I correct? Yeah, so you got some of that uh, information, which really showed, and I'll give you more detail tonight of what benchmarking is. So let's say that, again, I'm a cop. I'm at the coffee shop. I've been a barista for years. I've been kind of in the numbers, but not really. Um, my boss, my the owners that I work for, let me do a few of the things, but I never really got to see behind the curtain, so to speak. So how am I gonna develop my financials and why do I need to benchmark? What does this mean? Well, it means that I don't go out there and do something crazy in my first interaction with the bank or anybody. And hopefully I know that Harry and Brian at the SBDC would pull me back, but make sure that I don't say, well, my net profit margin is gonna be, I'm gonna make in my coffee shop $200,000 net profit first year, and I don't have any competition, and I, my gross revenue is going to be $5 million a year, right? So I'm just making these assumptions. I know that, and you guys maybe know some of these folks, but some folks that get into different things say, well, I don't have any competition. The market's a, is a half a billion dollars, and I can get 10% of that first year, right? Well, maybe you can. But maybe you should really, if you think you can, then benchmarking is a great way to help support where you're trying to go with that, right? It will help provide you some numbers. So Live Plan has a module, which I'll show you tonight, that has benchmarking in it that will help you with that. Remember I talked about 722-515? That's the coffee shop, snack bar, NAICS code. That will provide me peer group information, financials, of what's going on in that industry and what can I expect from the net profit margin. If you do go to the bank, the bank's gonna do the same thing. They're probably gonna, if they're looking for a loan, let's say that you're looking for 250 plus, they're probably gonna do a compare and spread to see where are your financials compared to what the industry trends are. And they'll pull that data. And so they'll look at that. So what we're trying to do here is get you prepared before you have that conversation with them and using live plan to do that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate that for you. So there'll be some tools that we can use. I sent a lot of folks vertical IQ. That was a soft, that's a software that I use. Um, uh, really decent software. It's for bankers. Um, anybody who's looking at industry trends. So it's pretty beneficial. It's a good tool. I also use one called BizBiner, which, which is also a good tool. Vertical IQ uses RMA. Um, which is a really well-known uh, benchmarking data set. Um, but, but BizMiner works as well. And then LivePlan is also based upon um, a, a software called ProfitSense, which pulls some different data sets in as well. So how are we identifying it? We're benchmarking. And again, it's just in developing realistic expectations. So again, if you have a restaurant and you say, typical restaurants, uh, 30 to 38% um, cost of goods, cost of sales for, uh, for um, food products. And if you come in and say, well, my cost of goods are 15%, immediately there's a problem because anybody who knows in that industry is gonna say, I don't trust your projections. We need to, you need to go back and look at those again, right? We're not sure that you've got all your costs included with that. So again, making sure that we can do realistic expectations. So when I'm doing coffee and I'm doing benchmarking, I like to do a little bit of uh, reviewing, again, looking at, I looked at um, Vertical IQ. I actually today for fun pulled up the National Coffee Data Trends. You can do this. Just go trust, trust, do some. I wouldn't trust everything that's out there, right? But do some, do some looking on some industry trends, um, associations, national associations. Um, I was going to ask Harry if he'd let us go to the uh, International Coffee um uh, association meeting next year it's in i think this year it's in milan italy i don't know if we have we have the money to go do that trip uh harry but we may have to ask um bank united or united banks so maybe they can help us with that but but again i'm looking at pulling industry trends so whatever you're looking at don't hesitate to go look at that if you can pull it now i did have to i did have to submit my email address to pull this for free but i did it was worth it for me because a lot of the information I'm gonna show you right here was validated in this, this report. And they did two surveys in 2020 
one for coffee shops, coffee sales in uh, the US. So again, other information that I can pull. And it may, I did this today because I want to pull the most date, recent data I could. I did this today and it took me a total of probably maximum of two and a half hours to pull all this information. So it's not like you're spending, you shouldn't be spending six weeks on just pulling all the market data. You need to start, you need, you need to uh, plan and pace yourself and not, and as I've seen people do before, over plan their business plan. So they can never pull the trigger. They're always trying to tweak this plan, right? And that's another, another thing where you have to say enough's enough or Harry will say, it looks good to me. Go ahead and talk to Nia, right? Or go ahead and talk to whoever. But again, making sure that, that you're, you're consistent with it and don't over plan your plan. So from that, my benchmarking narrative, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. This top, um, this top one in the red was also validated in the data I just showed you. 37% of the US coffee and demographics indicate 25 to 39 years of age are the largest consumers of coffee. They still are. So if you're pulling demographics in Southeast Queens, about 25 to 39 year olds, also, well, I got that pulled. What about what about um, socioeconomic or what about um, um, different different um, ethnic groups? Well, guess who drinks the most coffee? Hispanic Americans, 48% say they drink gourmet coffee. So if I'm a targeted market with that demographic, I may make more money, right? The least amount of folks uh, based upon this essential from the business reference guide is 23% of African Americans drink coffee with that, right? So they're just basing that off consumption data, look at that. So I'm thinking, hmm, may not make all my decisions based upon that, but it's something to keep, I always say, in my back pocket for later. Other, a couple other things. Coffee shops, I mentioned, will never make enough money on coffee sales alone. It may be a prime motivator to get people there, but coffee should be no more than 40% of your weekly sales. How did I find this? I, I pulled up business reference guide, like it's online. I just was looking at it. Well, makes a good point. So as I mentioned earlier about making sure that I can upsell Mr. Harry Wells to buy a caramel frappuccino, that's what I want to do. I want to make sure that Harry's spending more than three dollars. I need him to really spend in my shop eight to ten bucks, right? So every time he walks in, I know I got ten dollars coming out of his pocket, plus probably tips for my staff, right? So I'm looking at that, um, and that's where my customer service, my relationships, my engagement has to be paramount, right? The bottom part here, like I said, with the lady who had five Mister Coffees, it's easy to start a coffee house business, pretty. I'm not saying it's easy market entry, fairly decent, but it can be a higher risk based upon people perceiving that it's easy, right? Because you have some fluctuation with um, fixed with uh, variable costs with inputs like coffee beans and roasting. However, understanding those will make you successful. You need to understand location, wholesale pricing, all the things at the bottom differentiate yourself from the customer. From the customer. So that's extremely important to, to consider. So again, benchmarking. So we'll talk a little bit. I'm gonna pull up live plan here in a couple of slides and we'll go through how we start the whole process. And um, I'll quit blabbing about benchmarking and financials, but then you'll start seeing how we can put this all together. So as we try to develop the financials, we talked about searching for industry standards. What are the trends? How do we review trade organizations and, and resources? What's the customer base look like? Can I pull additional resources from the SBDC? Um, I, there's some sample plans that Julia mentioned last time uh, on live plan. I can show you where those are at. Um, there also maybe even your college. I'm not sure how the college is set up for that, but maybe there can be some resources too for that. But again, an incredible online resources. So make sure that they're vetted. Make sure that you know that, hey, this makes sense. And then all your assumptions should be confirmed with supporting information. One thing that people don't like that people will say like, well, I was talking to my friend Harry Wells and he said that we could really use a new Italian restaurant in this neighborhood. And I'm like, well, how do we, how do we, we need to validate that. We can't just, nothing against Harry, but we need to make sure it's just not Harry saying it. We need to make sure that the data says there may be a niche market there for something like that. So again, looking at how you can confirm the information. 
Okay, so I'm gonna show you a BizMiner report um, from 2021. I just pulled this today. The release date is August 20, whoops, sorry. The release date is um, August of 2021. And I did everything less than $5 million. So it's all small. You can see it went from $1 in sales to 5 million. The average is about um, 500,000. So for somebody who comes into me initially and says, I want to open a coffee shop and I'm going to make $4 million the first year. I'm going to like, well, you know, the average in our, in this targeted area is $500,000 to start with. You might want to go look at some more information with that. So again, looking at this. So this report will help us identify that. So anybody who's looking at this, um, Hector, can you tell me what your business was again? I'm sorry, I forgot it. It was in the part of uh, build uh, business consulting and uh, yeah, so business and, consulting, and, right? Yeah, and so coaching maybe, was the one that you that you sent me, right? Yeah. So that may be a little different, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, maybe some more uh, focused on retail with this one. But um, so we're looking at business revenue overall. Your business revenue is going to be a hundred percent, and what this does is show you what percentages of what the cost should be on an industry average, and I think this I can probably pull and look at it a little bit later, but these data points aren't just five businesses. These data points are anywhere from, typically they're gonna be from 150 to maybe 500 businesses that you're looking at with this. So again, what's my average, on the next slide, what's my average business revenue for coffee shops? And I, this is all US. I did not just target Queens, I probably could, um, but if I'm looking at the whole thing from overall, I'm looking at 529, to 537. It did have a bump up. This is through 2020. This is the most recent days, data I could pull. I couldn't pull post COVID yet. That will probably be ready in, a, I'm going to say, in January 2022. But I'm looking at $537,000 in sales, right? So my cost of sales is 227. What I really want to show you is we go down through all your costs. Your biggest costs are going to be um, your gross margin was 309 but you're looking at your sales and administration of about 70, 77,000, about 80,000. You work all the way down through it. So you sell $537,000 worth of revenue. Your after tax net profit based on this benchmark is $22,402. Now, what, the thing to keep in mind here is you're also in these projections paying yourself, okay? So you're paying yourself, you need to make sure of that, sticking to the plan with that. You also can have some add backs, like some depreciation potentially, maybe some interest expense that you're writing off on your taxes, some different things with that. So again, you could look at some, as you go back to the discretionary owner earnings, the very bottom one, the 22 may be like, oh man, I thought I would make more with this. The 58 says, yeah, I'm making about 10%, right? So about 10% net profit. So when I'm looking at that, those are some ad backs. And in those reports with BizMiner, you will get all, for the folks who got some of those, you will get um, the definitions with that. And um, Perry and I are working on pulling maybe some more of those together for, for some folks. So what this is showing you is like and comparable businesses in your NAICS code of what, of what they're generating uh, for potential profit. You can use this for small firms. You can use this for large firms. Um, I mentioned before that I work with some pretty large firms, um, construction companies doing deep excavation. They were doing tons of projects. Harry kind of knows this too from other construction projects, but ton, making tons of, they're doing like uh, $27 million worth of uh, revenue, but their net profit was like 2%, right? And they kept saying like, how can we not, how come we're not making more money? Well, I did a comparison compare with them on this data set, and I found out that they were they were too heavy in um, their labor costs. They were just had too many people working there. And so they reduced that down. And actually the market for that same type of business was 7.9% net profit. And we kind of got them back to that. But again, look, this can help you get, get to, to where some comparisons are. You may not want to do it all the time, but uh, maybe once every two years, you may want to go back and see how are you performing based on looking with your peers. This is the, the big thing that I always say, and I probably said this last time, but 
it's like um I don't know, I probably should have it in my office somewhere in the bottom part here, but it's important to have realistic projections. And you can have multiple sets of projections. I'm gonna ask uh, Miss Rock to cover her ears a little bit, but you can have sets that may be aggressive for yourself, thank you. You can may have them for yourself that you're just like, oh, I can do this. I'm, Hector says, I can go do this. And then you have other folks that may, they may say, I'm gonna to go to the bank, I'm gonna be really conservative with my projections and see what happens, right? So you're looking at that. So in some cases, it's okay to demonstrate a loss. You maybe have to do a lot of capitalization up front. We'd rather, you'd rather have you be honest about that up front than something that's way out of line. So, but there will be questions about why is there a loss the first year and you should be prepared for that. And then what's the net profit margin for coffee shops, right? I think it was about 5%. Um, and then after that's 10% when you have uh, discretionary owner earnings back about 4 point some percent actually. So the two things I want to take away, we always talk about doing these classes. We talk about what are some outcomes you want to remember that everybody's on this webinar. There, here's two things. If you project high and you don't meet expectations, what are the impacts, right? If you say, I'm going to do a million dollars in the coffee shop and you end up doing half a million in the coffee shop, what are the expectations, right? First of all, you're probably pretty upset with yourself if you're any kind of a, a business person. Number two is the investors may be like, hey, what's going on? The bank's gonna be like, whoa, make sure you're still paying us back, right? You know, that type of thing. But if you're conservative and you do, a, a, you know, middle of the road, even middle of the road, and you exceed expectations, what are the impacts? You're like, hey, we got a good thing going here. We did really well the first year. We exceeded expectations. So guess what? Family's happy, maybe you're going on another vacation. Um, banks happy, you're paying them back, maybe early. Investors are happy, they're making more money. So again, those two things are important. I see that a lot, people will come in. Um, I've been on both sides of the bank desk. So I used to, I'm so glad I sat behind it because trying to work with people to say, hey, if you can really, really show me what you think you can do, let's, let's look at the industry trends and see what you can do. That's extremely important for anything that you guys are doing, it's extremely important. And sometimes you may have the unknowns. You may not know a targeted market, like I'm gonna go down this targeted market. I think there's this many people, but maybe it's larger or maybe it's smaller, or maybe you have to expand your geography for it. So again, looking at that. So back to benchmarking, um, the financial institution I mentioned, we'll do a look at this doing comparisons. It's important for projections to be clear, clearly with assumptions. How did, you how did you arrive at those? And I'll show you here shortly. And then how are they calculated? I always do cups of coffee, average ticket price. So when I mentioned about Harry spending 10 bucks in my coffee shop, I'm always gonna calculate that based upon what I pull from data, what the average retail data point would be. So if I'm doing anything else in the market, um, Hector, just as far as consulting goes, sometimes you may leave money on the table that you wish you had now, but you learn from that too in the consulting world about how much you have and how much you can work with, right? I mean, it's it's always out there. So the other thing too, is you may get a call that you did a project for X and you did such a good job on it. They're like, hey, we've got some extra money available for this. We'd like you to do this, right? Can I do that? So again, it's always getting, getting more comfortable with where you're going with that consulting side and how that works. Um, the other thing too, would be like, uh, Tehran, like how much are you charging for specific certifications for driving, right? What does that look like? And what, what does your revenue model look like? And also evaluating, you can do this, what your competition looks like, right? Who's charging what for what? So you kind of have an idea uh, with that. Um, financial institution, let's know the market data. And again, referencing the plan, you looked at some different things with it. So with that said, um, I'm gonna get ready to launch into live plan and walk through some data points with you. and. I'm really gonna focus on the income statement or the profit and loss statement tonight, because I think a lot of folks can, will have a good indication with that. When we do the full class in January, for those folks that are interested, we're gonna do the full financial development. We're like, we're gonna go through every part of the balance sheet. We're gonna go through all the assets, liabilities. We're gonna go through financing. We may even go, um, a lot of times when I work with clients, we may 
um, have them propose that they do interest only with the bank for maybe three to six months to get some cash flow going and then amortize that over the same period of time. It may be 84 months, it may be 120 months, it may be whatever, whatever that looks to be for a bank policy. So again, looking at that, that, that process. So we'll talk about that. But tonight we'll talk about the forecast setting up. As you can see here, I use Precision Works, but I also have a coffee shop one that, that I'll show you tonight, starting in January 22. The coffee shop I actually started like a realistic one. I think it's July, June of 2022. So it gave, gives us time to get the business plan together, gives us time to talk to the bank, gives us time to get the financing, find a location, work with a landlord, all of that. So I also linked the forecast. Nia, you can, you can shake your head if I'm wrong on this. Anything over three years, if you're shooting five years for projections, the bank's only going to typically look at the first three years. Am I correct on that? Yep. So you can press five years for yourself, but don't take that to the bank with you because they're only going to look at those first three years. The other thing, too, is month, month to month detail. They want to see what you're projecting month to month for the first year. You don't have to do two years unless they ask you for it. But again, that's typical one month. And then you can spread out monthly charges, the whole thing. So let me go back here. You can do multiple languages too with this if you want to do it in Spanish or other ones. Those you can see that. And the number separators are a thousand and currency is a dollar. So I, like I mentioned last time, I have worked with some clients in Dubai a couple of times remotely like this. And then I've worked with some folks in the UK. Um, same kind of process with that. So I'm kind of looking through it. Um, we'll go through the tables and the forecast. Anytime, if, uh, another, here's, here's another reminder. If you ever get lost and you're like, where are all my tables at? How do I find the tables to do data input? If you're going through the financial tables, all you have to do is click on the green financial tables right there and we'll repopulate revenue through financing for you. It'll just pop right up. Sometimes you may go and click on the profit and loss and this line will be hidden. All you have to do is go back and hit financial tables and I'll show you that. It'll come right back up for you. Um, Again, I talked about we'll do profit and loss. You can do it per year. We can show you per month too with, uh, with that. So we're going to go into the revenues module first, and we're going to go through and do unit sales. Uh, we're going to go through, uh, like this is subcontract work. I'll show you in the coffee shop exactly what we're going to do. But you can do unit sales, billable hours. Again, um, some different folks that may be doing billable hours for a project. Reoccurring charges. If you have like a gym or a subscription or you're doing rentals, maybe you're doing, maybe you have rental units or you're doing rentals for something else. Maybe you're renting, maybe you're renting car out. I don't know. But looking at that web apps, you got a web app and you're looking at technology. What does that look like? And then anything else. And then the, the least, my least favorite one is revenue only because you can't, if you do modify that, you're going to have to go back and recalculate it, that a lot of times. Um, with what's going on. So I like to use unit sales if possible for retail or billable hours. I've done some reincurring charges with tech companies on some web apps, which, you know, or actually let's say that I'm doing an HVAC company and Harry can pay me a hundred bucks a year and I'll do put maintenance on this HVAC on the, the filter and maybe just taking some check. So we look at those two from a, from a reoccurring charge uh, perspective. And we'll get ready for the walkthrough. We'll go through the unit sales. I'll talk about how many, how many we'll do, and then I'll, I'll walk through these uh, things. I wanted to provide this for folks who didn't get a chance to maybe sit in the webinar, but really look at the modules of what those modules look like and what they can do with it. So with that being said, I'm going to escape out of here real quick, and then I'm going to pull, not literally, but I'm going to pull... Um, I'm going to pull live client up real quick and we're going to share that screen and get ready to, to do that. Um, can you see the, can you see this pitch right here? Can you somebody give me a heads up? You guys can see it. Should I make it bigger? Does it, does it need to be bigger? Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, appreciate that. So I was just going to show you a completed one I did for this. 
Um, it's not perfect, but it, it does. So it's called high voltage coffee station. My thought was maybe a little more difficult in specific communities or cities, but looking at this from, uh, from a, maybe you can uh, quick charge your car, go in and grab a coffee, car's done, right? Recharge like a, um, a plug-in hybrid, whatever it may be. But so just looking at this, so the opportunity we have is what's the problem we're solving? Um, looking at available food services in the area, meeting space, neighborhood interaction, uh, quality source coffee and business catering. Um, maybe doing some coffee at meetings for Harry's SPDC meetings or different things trains he may have. So I may be providing that. What are solutions? A good neighborhood field coffee house. One thing that's unique, I, I did a, lot of, a little bit of work on. If you notice in Starbucks, the, the seating is not really super comfortable. Or even if you look at a Dunkin, it doesn't want you, doesn't tell you to stay there a long time. If you go to like local coffee shops, a lot of them are dark, look like your living room or maybe your den or a library. Right, so they have they have different things going on there. So again, they're looking at the churn where the maybe a, a neighborhood feel for a gathering place or social interaction. Things to keep in mind: put in your back back pocket. I'm going to offer service to food services to local bakery, conference room availability. Hours of operation are going to be longer, and I'm going to have an open night mic. I'm going to have like music at, in the evenings. I'm going to have. Um, Poetry. I'm going to have dip, all kinds of eclectic things in there. I'm sure Mr. Clay Haynes would be visiting my, guarantee he'd be visiting my coffee shop and be in the highlight there. So with that. So I got 570 prospects that I'm looking at. I put this, just put this together. And here's my, here's my competition. Some three things that I just made up. What's my funding I need? $250,000. As we mentioned in the last class, we did not attend the first class. How to do this will be in the video. I'll, you'll walk you right through the whole thing. Um, hour and 35 minutes of how to prepare the pitch, okay, with this. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Sales channels, direct to consumer, wholesale, special events. I'm gonna do some social media like everybody says, but I'm really gonna try to target certain demographics, certain events, certain web pages. Um, I'm also gonna work with the local chamber of commerce and economic development groups good source for me to go do special event um, opportunities with them. My, my revenue streams are coffee, food, merchandise, and wholesale beans. I'm actually gonna work with York College to, to have a York College Cardinal blend where I'm gonna sell it for like 15 bucks a bag and they're gonna make eight bucks, six bucks a bag off of it for a fundraiser for whatever they're doing. So again, I'm looking at those, this is my, this is my experience working with these clients. Those are some things that I'm thinking about as I put this together, okay? Um, let's see, website, um, I'm not really sure I'd do Shopify, I'm probably gonna do Square with that and this lease and utilities. So I'm at Milestones in January 22, um, two days before Harry's birthday, I'm gonna form my legal entity, entity which is on Monday, a store layout, I'm gonna work with my landlord on the store layout, and I'm also gonna review the lease locations within that building uh, with a landlord. I put in some pictures today um, based upon this of who my key people are. I've got Micah Pallison, who's gonna run it. She's ran multiple um, coffee shops. She's gradu graduated from a barista school, so she knows what she's doing, right? I've also got a lead barista. Um, we also had some experience in some culinary programs. I have uh, Fritzy Steffensmeyer, who's gonna be doing my lead baking with me. So again, why am I putting these people here? Let's just be honest, Nia may know who some of these people are, right? She may know that I'm building a really good team here um, as I'm going through this. The other thing too is in the consulting world or anybody else, you may be doing something too where people may know who, hey, I'm working with this, this, um, this person who has an expertise in finance, this person may have it in, um, business formation, maybe an attorney, whoever else. So you can see that I have five folks in my, my team and my key roles. I also have some partners and resources. I've got people from the SPDC. No, no offense, Nia, but I was being trying to be funny here. I'm a commercial lender from the Too Much Money Bank from Athena Wilkerson. So Athena's got a lot of money. Um, Seneca Guerrero is my attorney. And then I got um, another guy who's another center for economic success that I'm working with. 
that's trying to help me engage into more marketing outreach. So again, all I did was pull, pull data. If you got photos of who you have working for you, it does look pretty slick. And as I mentioned before, all you need to do is hit publish. You can publish to a specific website. I also can present this as a PowerPoint to Nia or whoever else, to, to Harry. I can do a draft run with Harry on a pitch proposal. And I can also download and print it, which I've done today. And it, it actually ended up in three pages. So I did three pages here. And then just the, just the primary things that keeps me going. If I am having that initial discussion, who am I talking to with that? So what does that look like? Yeah, for sure. So let me go back here to the top and let me go to forecast. If you guys could raise your hands, who's excited about trying to go through the forecast? <laughs> huh? I am. Angela, you are? Anybody else? <laughs> Yvette? Is it Yvette? There's one. Nia yeah, yeah. is. Of course, Nia is. Yeah, right, Nia? Anybody else? Okay. Well, I'll get the rest of you engaged with this, and we'll see what we can do. So I'm going to start to go through. Remember I talked about the financial table section? When you're trying to put the financials together, one of the things that you really, really want to focus on is, first of all, you need to go to forecast, financial tables. Remember I talked about the other sections went away, profit yeah. and loss. Just go right back to financial tables and you'll pull up revenue, direct costs, personnel costs, expenses, assets, taxes, dividends, cash flow assumptions, and financing. Tonight, I'm going to focus specifically on revenue, direct costs, some personnel, the expenses, cash flow, and financing. I will touch a little bit on taxes, okay? So, for example, anything that you see when you're working on these financials, anything in blue, you can edit. It's got a pencil, just like we did before um, when we were looking at the other stuff that you can hover over. So I can go to coffee, and I'm going to go to that in a second, but I'm going to walk through this. Uh, you can also um, it'll break it down for additional things. So if I click on the arrow for coffee, it'll tell me unit sales and unit prices. So I know I'm conservative with these numbers, but I, I felt that if I did um, over a 365 day year, right? If I'm looking, how many people can I, can I pull into my shop in a year on average that I think can walk by or be, come to my place that I can service, right? Over the year. And I'm open seven days a week, right? So I'm kind of looking at that. What are my unit prices? I typically like, to be honest with you, I typically like to get a retail ticket out the door. When I work, and I have worked with a lot of coffee shops, by the way. Um, but if I'm looking at these, I like to have eight, eight to ten dollars plus per ticket. Like I was joking around, but I'm really serious with Harry. Like I need, I need to look at ten dollars. So I got six here. And if I look at my wholesale beans, and I'm not, wholesale beans are going to be different. I'm going to sell that again to York College with the Cardinal Blend. It's going to be a nice bag. It's going to have York College logo on it. It's going to, whatever they pick, right? So I'm going to sell beans that way. I'm also going to have baked goods. And I'm going to click on this arrow. My baked goods are going to be, I'm going to do different bakery products, and they're going to be $4. So again, I'm looking at $6 plus $4. So Harry Wells is walking out spending 10 bucks in my coffee shop, right? That helps me get the cash flow going, right? Um, with that. I also have a little bit of merchandise. I also will sell retail beans in the store. Those are $12 for my retail beans, higher blends, uh, free trade, uh, whatever else it may be. I'm, I'm looking at selling those. And also I'm doing some business catering. So you saw that every one of those arrows I clicked on I can expand and I'll show you how we're going to get to that. Okay. The other thing I wanted to show you, which is extremely important when you're putting financials together through live plan is don't be static with your numbers. Okay. When I mean static is don't make column one, two, and three, all $175,000 or $200,000. Show some growth. 
One thing that I like to work with clients on is showing three to five, typically 5% growth in revenue. If you think you can do it, you can do higher, that's fine. But also make sure that you're not just increasing your revenue. Make sure you're also increasing your expenses because it's going to take more cups to sell more coffee. It's going to take more beans. It's going to take, right? So we're walking through that whole thing. So if you notice in everything I've done here, right? I've got 172, 192, and 213. So I'm looking at increases, right? I'm also looking at my wholesale beans. I feel like I can be pretty productive with that. My baked goods, the same thing. Um, I actually show a pretty good, pretty good chunk in that third year because my baked goods are really taking off. Um, my retail beans, same thing. So again, one of the things you don't want to do is walk into to SPDC when we work with us, when you're talking to the bank, when you're talking to investors, and you go in with static numbers for three years because they're going to, which I've done, it's like, come on, you've got to show some growth here. There's got to be something here and make sure that you're showing your expenses too with that. So again, looking at, looking at that. Does that make sense for everybody? Everybody follow me with that? Yes. Teron, if you're doing more with that, like if you're doing more training, you're going to have some more expenses, right? Because you probably can't take care of everybody. Um, but if you're going out and doing some, I'm going to say you're doing some live driving with people, you know, getting them set up and the whole thing might take more people to, to work through that process. So you're going to have increased revenue, but maybe some increased cost too. I always... Typically, I always do at least a minimum of 3% for revenue or for expenses too, and I'll show you that when we get to that. So I, I'm always looking at to, to increase that, that whole thing. So, so with that being said, I'm going to go through each one of these, and we're going to go through uh, fairly quickly with the coffee. So I'm going to click on this one. If you want to add a revenue stream, all you do is click add a revenue stream at the bottom. And you can call it whatever you want to call it. You could call it Theron, you could call it bus driving class, or you could call it, you know, student driver class, or you know, whatever you're thinking about, right? You can call it that. What I did with this one is I went to coffee. So what I want to call it, I want to call it a coffee for revenue stream. And then I all I do is type in coffee, right? Coffee. I'm gonna click next. So as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of the unit sales because that helps me identify it. You, again, billable hours are great. Reoccurring charges are great. Revenue only is okay, um, but you need to, you can't really, you can't, when you print it out, you can't really see that specifically. So I'm gonna go next. And then what I went to, let me go back for one second and show you this because it's gonna be important for whatever you do. I, when I go to next again on unit sales, after I type copy in, there's two things you can click here. There's a constant amount. And you heard what I said about that. I'm not a big fan of that. But you could say it's $1,500 a month. Or I can go varying amounts, right? Right? So I, I'm going to do varying amounts, which means, remember I talked about seasonality with coffee shops? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start this business in June of 22. So I might say, I'm going to start $1,500. I might hit $1,800. And I, I'm just making this up right now. But I might hit 2,000, but then I'm really seeing some pretty good increases in September, October, November, December. I see a drop off back in January because people are holding tight and then they're coming back out. So each one of these I can type in per month. You can also drag this uh, little graph to, and if you like at the next one, I could say like, well, I'm gonna go right there. You see what I did? I just clicked it right there and it'll go if I wanna go 4,000, back to 4,000. I actually don't, I think I wanna go down like 2,500. I might go to 27, 2,600 maybe, maybe in April. People are getting out more then. So overall, I have 32,550 folks that are buying coffee, right, for the year. It's quite a bit. But if I'm looking at that overall, then what is my calculation going to be for 2024 and 2025? Well, if you heard what I said earlier, I might take that times 5%. I might take that times something that I feel like, hey, I, I feel I've seen some data and I feel like I can do 7% with that, right? So anyway, if I'm looking at that, 
I might, I might do something else. I'm just going to put the number in here though. I'm going to put 35,000 even, and then I might do, I might back it off a little bit to do 36.5, right? So that's for, that, this is month to month for that 12 months for my first year, and then 2024 and 2025, okay? So everybody follow me with that? Yeah. That's numbers that I'm, I'm, I make, I'm, I'm basing those off of my benchmarking data, but I'm also look, thinking this through as far as what my math looks like, okay? So I'll click next. And then it's going to ask me, well, what's my price over that time period, right? What's my price per cup for coffee, right? Remember I talked about $6? So I put $6 in overall for the 12 months. Same thing, varying prices over time per month. And then I did a slight increase in 2024 to 650 and I went to $7 in 2025. Okay? So this is where the magic works, right? It's not a spreadsheet. It's not where it's like, you got to worry about all the formulas all matching all up. What you're doing is taking data input and putting it in here. I hit save and close. And it saved and closed pretty close to what I had before. Saved and closed my coffee. And it shows you again my unit sales and my prices. Okay. So for everything like Toronto, I'm going to pick you again. For every revenue source you have, the more definitive you can be for that class, bus driving, whatever else the classes are, you say you have a flat fee for that. It may be more down the road. That way, the better information you can put in here, the better results you're going to have long term to look at that. Okay. So if you just say, I'm going to generate 100,000 a year, how, well, how's your calculation? You can calculate it right here in the software. I did the same thing for baked goods, retail beans, and catering as well. Okay. And if I wanted to add other things like meeting space, I'm going to charge for the meeting space. Our conference room, I might charge 100 bucks a meeting for lunch, or I might, might not charge anything, but I can easily do that by just going to add a revenue stream, okay? If you, if you have any questions about this later after this, don't hesitate to send Brian Young an email or myself, and we'll make sure that we can uh, go with that. Hector, go ahead. You have a question. Uh, yes, uh, Brian, thank you. In the example of the coffee, let's say you have your small coffee, your medium coffee, and your large coffee, which are priced at different uh, um, um, points. How did you put that, or do you have to create a revenue stream for each of the sizes of the cup of coffee? You, you can do that. Um, absolutely, you can do that. And you can base it up on size. So you could put like coffee small, coffee medium, coffee large, based on what you think. Because again, your input costs are going to be different, right? Your, mm. your input cost for size of cup, your lids will probably all be the same, but you're looking at different sizes. So that's an excellent question. There's two ways of looking at that too. The more detail you have, hopefully the closer to the realistic numbers that you're going to get. For they're called projections. They're not called actuals, right? Actuals come afterwards. So again, it's a great question that you have there. So I, I'm just looking at that overall um, is important. So you could do that. I actually had a guy I worked with with flower shops who had 65 different flowers that he did that whole thing with. Wow. He wrote every one of those out. I couldn't believe he did it. Like, but he's like, I make the most money off these. So I want to target this grouping, then my next one, then my next one. So um, gladiolas, he made a ton of money off gladiolas. So that was his, that was his go-to besides roses. Okay. So, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank Thanks you, a lot for the question. So with that being said, and it, um, again, not to see anybody else. Mr. Clay Haynes, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, sure. I am feeling a, a bit anxious because uh, the direction I want to take my business is, is going to be fairly digital in regard to people uh, accessing me and, I guess, requesting the service I'd be providing. Um, however, uh, there may be some instances where, where I would be interacting with people. Uh, some of my work would be having to do with the, with the actual physical music studio. Um, some instances I may re require a particular space for consultation with my client. But um, I, I've, I've found myself a bit overwhelmed in regard to some of the resources that you mentioned earlier in regard to like uh, getting, I guess, historical data, uh, market data and so on. And um, would, would my homework be to watch this video again is there like a, a cache where i can go to and kind of find 
a, a variety of methods to do my particular research. Um, my bad, my video is off. I might be a little flipped, but um, but yeah, I'm, I I, I want to make sure that I have that I'm utilizing the resources that you mentioned um, to the best of my ability because I, I I've made the mistake of like asking for particular prices and then realizing that they're kind of in the north, in the north beauty section for some people. You know what I mean? So right. So um, so I did yeah. send I did send you some basic benchmarking data so if i recall but i'm not saying it's going to be perfect for yeah. what you do you may have to say like how much is overall the worst case scenario how much is an hour in a studio right or how much is a how mm -hmm. much is how much time in a, in a meeting space is it going to cost you right to meet with the client right yeah. so those will be the expenses that i'll talk about in a little bit but again make sure that you're identifying what your revenue is if you're charging per hour right an hourly rate for yeah. those clients that's where it goes back and you should really be looking at, at those rates. So if I had an, had an revenue stream and I'm just going to type this in all the leader, but I'll just type in, um, I'm just going to use this one. Okay. Music consulting. Like you're having initial meetings with people. I'm just, I'm just saying this. I might do, um, I might do a billable hour with that. And I'm going to charge varying amounts. Like if I feel like I'm going to work with five clients a month, I'm just throwing this out, right? You know better than that than I would. But if you say like, I'm going to work with five a month, here's a quick trick. Well, let's say, let everybody, let's say that Mr. Clay Haynes is going to do five a month. All I have to do is hover over the butt, over the three dots. Hector, this is something for you to look at and just hit apply. And it'll populate it itself for you. The only thing that's bad about that is static numbers, right? So right. Mr. Clay Haynes, you're going to do 60 the first year. And then I'm going to say you're going to do 75. And then you're going to do 90, all right? I grew by 15. So that's the folks that you're going to work with in the studio for consulting, right? Like you're, maybe you're just having initial discussions with them. Then what's your rate is? What is going to be your constant rate per hour, right? You may do different rates based upon years or increased costs that you may have studio time or, or different times with that. So does that make sense to you? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Sure. So that's what I'm saying. So I'm going to... And if you ever want to delete anything back off, all you have to do is hit the trash can. It'll ask you to confirm it. And all I do is hit it again. Okay. Okay. Yep. You, you, so, you mentioned, uh, you, you chose some vocabulary. You said, you said uh, worst case scenario. So for me, in, in, that's, in that context, the worst case scenario would be like a super high cost for studio time. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So look, right. that's a, thanks for catching that because that would be like, what would be, the worst case, and if you can negotiate that studio time down based upon maybe you're a great customer of the studio, maybe they're going to keep reducing it down for you, or maybe you're you're in and out quicker than a lot of people with the studio too. Who knows? So again, that would be uh, based upon um, your your experience with that. Awesome. With that with that said, I, I want to try to go through the rest of these, and then um, I'll answer some more questions uh, toward the end, if possible. And then if anybody has questions, they, again, you can email me. I'm available uh, most of the time. And then also Brian Young, if you, you don't get a hold of me, email him and we'll make sure that we get you the exact uh, information that you need. Many times what will happen is um, if Mr. Clay Haynes is in the same uh, software that I'm in, he may make a change and I may be working with him. He can make a change. I'll see the change immediately. I make the change. He can see the change immediately. And we can look at that, right? Together and, and see like what makes sense and what doesn't, right? I don't know everything. Um, my wife knows that for sure. But um, <laughs> but one thing that I one thing that I try to do is I try to just base it off assumptions. I, I try to figure out what the assumptions may be, right? And what what makes sense? Um, does it make sense and does it not make sense, right? So uh, looking at that, I think I mentioned last time I work with a project on big honeybee producers or. Apiers is what they're called. I didn't really know a lot about bees at all, except I don't want to get stung by them, but I learned so much about bees because I'm digging through the data sets just to figure out what it looks like, right? That type of thing. So same with you, Mr. Clay Haynes. I may not know a lot about it now, but I'd go dig, dig, dig to see what we could do to help you. And I know Brian Young would and, and Harry would as well. So I'm going to move on to direct costs. So a couple of things with direct costs. And if you can follow with me with this, like uh, Tehran, like this would be like the fuel cost, right? If you estimate what your fuel cost is for training, you're driving people around, 
again, I'm using you from an, another example besides coffee, but direct costs are costs attributed to what your revenue is. So if you estimated like your direct cost for coffee and you're going to sell cups, you, get, you put it in the cup, that's a direct cost. That's immediate. Also, your coffee supply is a direct cost, right? It's attributed right to that product. So when Hector asked the question about small, medium, and large, you could actually attribute it potentially back to that. If you've got a couple of years under your belt, you could really get more definitive with what your costs are. Maybe at some point you say, I don't want to sell medium coffee because I make more off the small and the large than I do the medium, right? My, my net profit margin. Maybe. So again, so what I look at is my direct costs. And if you look at this, my direct costs are based upon cost of goods and also my salary and wages. So how did I come up with this? You're thinking like, how do you know what your cost of goods are? Well, my cost of goods, and I sorted it by a general cost, and I did a percentage of overall revenue, right? So Mr. Clay Haynes, it'd be a little tougher in your position with this. It's easier with retail, but it's also potentially with like Tehran and some other folks as well. What's your percent of overall revenue? How do I know that? I don't really know that, but I'm going to go back and look at my benchmarking data. Remember I talked about those percentages? And that percentage was like, I don't know, 32%. So, and then here it says overall revenue. What's my cost of goods? 40%, okay? That's what the, that's what the data set BizMiner or Vertical IQ will show me. So what I put in here is my percent of overall revenue is 40%. What does that do? It takes 40% times my revenue and tells me what my costs are gonna be, right? My direct costs will be on that. Again, am I developing a spreadsheet with tons of numbers and confusing and that I may not know exactly what the formulas are? Don't have to do it. This does it for us. And it starts with that. So again, I hit save and close. That's my direct cost, right? For that year, for, um, for my cost of goods, 140, 167. Again, it's dynamic numbers. It's not just static. I also do the same thing with, with, um, with um, salary and wages. There's two different things on salary and wages. So on, these are, I call them chargers because it was high voltage. So the people working there are chargers. So I'm trying, trying not to be too funny, um, but I'm looking at those folks. They're all part-timers. So I have like 12 people working there, which means four part-time four part people uh, working for me. So I took that percentage too. And that number that showed me in BizMiner was uh, uh, coming up here. I had four people, charger. I go next. I go direct labor because it's a direct labor. It's right to that source. And it was 2.58% is what my data set showed me. So what I did is I put an overall percentage of revenue in 2.58%, right? So again, I'm starting that. So that shows me, I hit next. They're on staff employees or not. Con the reason they asked me this is, do I have to pay benefits? Am I paying like FICA and everything else? Sure. If they're contract workers and maybe 1099, I may not have to pay that. Not to get in too deep, deep with the accounting, but... Again, they're on staff employees and I click that and it calculates it for me. So overall, my direct costs are 42 and a half percent. That's what it calculates for me, okay? So for what I'd like to do now is just show you what we've built so far with this and show you what it looks like. So when Nia asked you, do you have a profit and loss statement? Yes, we do. We built the cost of goods. I've also built the revenue right here, right? And it shows me my bottom line, my net, the net profit showed about four, three to uh, four percent. I'm about three percent, pretty, pretty conservative. But I'm looking at this overall for my cost of goods and all of my my revenue. So it will build it just like this. It automatically pulls it back and builds it for you. And I, I really believe this is a really good tool. Um, and you're going to have questions on it, and then we can walk you through through that process. So the next thing I want to talk about is the operating expenses, though, because um, Mr. Clay Haynes was asking about that. I'm sure other folks as well, like, what are my expenses? What expenses should I put in there? There's two ways of doing that. One way is that I use is the benchmarking data sets. A lot of times they'll use, they'll use specifically salary, rent, advertising, Maintenance, maintenance repairs, and then they'll dump everything else in the sales general administration um, overall. 
and they'll dump that in as overall. So that would include like, um, that would include like maybe utilities. It's going to cost me for electrical, my insurance, um, other things that you may have over supplies, different things that may be like accounting supplies. It may be contractual, maybe an attorney fee, uh, maybe Wi-Fi be included with that. So there's two ways of doing that. One way is basing it off the benchmarking data, which I've done here. And I've also done it the other way, which I'll show you. We, you can list out all of your expenses, what you think. I think that's better long-term once you get a, a year or two under your belt, but this is a good way to do it um, up front with this. So again, we'll go to operating expenses. Remember I talked, there's two, I said there's two things about cost of goods. There's, there's the, uh, oops, sorry. There's the direct labor. So there's salary and wages, wages here that are directly attributed to the business. And then there's also like, I own the coffee shop. I'm also gonna pay myself a portion of this salary out of this. So again, there's multiples. So what I've done with this one is I base it off the benchmarking, salary and wages, other expense, overall revenue, everything combined. And I did another percentage of 17.18. That's again, what data sets are showing me that what overall. So I'm just giving myself a macro look at this. Not to say that I'm ever gonna, if I'm using all these percentages, I'm gonna stop modifying this. What I'm doing is building it and then fine tuning it from what I think later, okay? That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm giving myself a basis for it. When should this expense begin? In June of 2022, I hit save and close. And um, again, I'm gonna go back down here to, to my salary and wages. Uh, I might go to advertising. Marketing expense, percent of overall revenue was 1.79 is what the data showed. I put January 23, this actually should be, uh, let me go June 22. Let's have that along here. So I'll save and close. And that will give me a more succinct number with that. Now, one thing I wanted to show you as well, down toward the bottom, there's a little toggle box here that can show your monthly detail. When I like to build these, I like to build them from a yearly basis so I can check and see do things look correct, are there any errors or mistakes in my data entry? But then I can also hit monthly and I'll do June through whatever date it is, okay? June through July of next year. So I'll do 12 months. So again, when I'm looking at maintenance and repairs, I'm looking at um, sales and general administration. That's from a monthly basis that showed there. If this will pull up. So, so with that, we went, we've covered so far revenue, cost of goods. Some of you may not have direct cost of goods. Some of you may. If you're doing final publication or doing consulting or you have to go do some different things, there may be costs attributed to that specific client or project. If you're doing, um, I think the event you were doing the badge holder, if you got cost of goods with what each one of those products costs you, you know what your cost of goods are, right? You're going to know, right. attribute that back to revenue. So if you generate a million dollars, you know that it's going to cost you 25% to make each one of those, right? So you can do that calculation of that cost of goods. So. All right. So I'm going to go back real quick and make sure on the PowerPoint. I'm going to share this real quick. Cost of goods. Just give me a thumbs up if someone can see. Yeah, you guys can see the screen now, correct? You guys see that? Good. Okay, excellent. 
So another thing that I mentioned is you can use different expense accounts, cost of sales goods, um, cost of goods, cost of sales. You also can do advertising, bank service charges, delivery, depreciation, insurance, um, salaries, all the way through that. When I started doing, I, I built, I kind of like, uh, I built up a few economic development nonprofits that I worked in in my career. So really in my career, I got pretty lucky. I got to be a boss at like 28, right? Which is crazy now that I think about it. But I learned a lot about this stuff early on in my career. And I built one up from three employees and 300,000 to about 50 employees and about 5.5 million. And so this down the road was so important to me early on not as important to me because I was still trying to churn and build and build programs and really provide some good service. So, but this was essential for me long-term uh, as where I was trying to go with the over, overall operation. So I wanted to show you that. This will be in the, the handout so you can look at this. These are some basic ones. You may have other ones that you want to include there. Um, one may be uh, consulting. I don't know if you have consulting in there, but you may have some consulting with like, uh, you have legal, I guess consulting is a, but you may have something where you're looking for somebody to help you with one part of a project. Again, Hector, I'm going back to you. You may pull another consultant in to help you with something that you may pay them out of some, pay them out with something like that. Or um, Tehran, you may have somebody else too that you're pulling in with you. So I talked about the expenses and talked about that. Um, one of the things I'll go back and talk about personnel and taxes. So there's going to be sales tax and some things with retail that you're required to pay. There may be other city taxes you're required to pay. There may be a, a business tax, whatever else, but you can set those rates right here under set tax rates based upon your loca location. So if you are in Southeast Queens, I should look this up exactly what that number is, but we, we can pull that together for you and look at that. So on these page here, you have income taxes too. You can put down what you think or estimate what that rate's going to be, how often you're going to pay those. And then you can also look at sales tax, right? You can put the calculation there too. What's important is the sooner you put that in there, you also know what your true revenue or your true net profit's going to be with the taxes. A lot of people in small business forget about the tax side and um, they're just putting money in the bank and then they're like, oh no, I got to pay X amount in taxes. It's tax time. So again, looking at that um, is extremely important to look at um, forecasting out the taxes. So those modules are just like what we just went through with revenue, um, cost of goods, cost of sales, direct costs, and also expenses. So they'll be the same thing. Um, you can forecast the cash flow, and I'll show you that. You can do cash flow assumptions, but you do sales on credit, how long it's going to be. Using a coffee shop, you're going to get paid 90% of the time you're gonna get paid right then, but you may do some things where you're doing um, catering, where you may be doing coffee and pastries and stuff. You may be doing later where it takes you to get paid. So really try to identify the cash flow for retail and a high volume businesses, that's important. Um, for some other ones that may not be, um, Yvette, you may be, again, I'm going to you, you may be putting a lot of money in up front for production, manufacturing of your product, waiting for monies to come back in too, right? So again, looking at the cash flow with what that looks like um, and, and making sure to determine that you've got a good price point on what you're trying to accomplish. I'll talk about financing. It's kind of fun to put that. You can do different models with it, but, the, but that will be uh, pretty slick. And then I'll go through that and I'll talk about downloading and print. So I'm gonna go back real quick um, with this. And I'm gonna pull up back to live plan. Can you guys see the live plan screen again? Yep, cool. So I'm gonna go over to, um, back to my back to my tables, where's all my tables at? Well, I hit financial tables and I can click them all. And I'm gonna go over to the taxes real quick. This is what I put in for taxes. All I'd have to do is hit set the tax rates, income taxes, they typically go with 20% right here. I kept it the same thing. 20% is pretty close, 20%. So I went with next. What revenue streams have uh, sales tax, coffee, baked goods? If I'm doing wholesale beans to somebody, I may not pay sales tax, but I'm putting that in. 7%, probably maybe close to the 10%. Um, how often will you pay it? Hit save and close. 
kind of looking at that perspective. Now, when I'm going to cash flow assumptions, this is what I'm looking at. So cash flow assumptions, you're like, well, what is this? Like, why do I need to worry about cash flow? Two things you should worry about. You can look at your P&L and say, oh, I'm making all this money, but where's all your cash, right? Like it says, I'm making $100,000, but your cash is all gone. It's all in the product or it's all in inventory. What you need to really look at is that and cash flow. Where are you at? So you can look at this and you can adjust this for revenue streams, but you can also adjust it by sales on credit. So I'm going to slide this back down. My sales on credit are going to be 10%. My days to get paid at the most are 15 days from, let's say that I'm selling it to a catering for, well, Harry for the college, it may be like 30 days, which is not a problem. It's like it's city or government may take 30 days to get paid for my catering. My purchases on credit, I've got good credit. So I'm purchasing everything up front and I'm paying, I'm gonna get 70%. Here's a quick question. If I'm getting paid within 30 days, do I wanna pay out at the same time or do I wanna wait a couple of days? Julia, you got an idea? I'd say wait a couple of days. You want to wait. Yeah, because it gives you, um, you know, room for error if there's a delay, if the, you know, the payments are late. And then that would make you late. So you don't want to do that. Yep. Perfect answer. That's exactly what you want to do. So if you were at 15, you probably want to do 30. You got the cash in, go into the bank, then you can pay everything off, right? So the sooner you get the cash in, the better off you're going to be with, with, uh, paying that out. So again, looking at that, if you're going to do any inventory, how many months you're going to keep on hand? This coffee shop, I was going to keep one month on hand because I, I want to churn. I don't want to have a lot of inventory sitting around uh, with it. And my minimum order, order size is like 5,000. I put in, you can put whatever that is that you want to put in there. That. So again, it's sliders. You can, you can um, play with it, try different things, see what you think. Um, I'm going with a few people. Again, I'm going to go back to Tehran. You may want to ask very little sales on credit because you want to get people through the class or through the training. You want to make sure you got your cash up front so you can make sure everything's fuel, whatever else you're working on with that. So, okay. So the last thing I have is financing to cover with this section. So with the financing, I put a, I put in a 200, remember the front page on the pitch? I put the pitch I put, I wanted $250,000, right? I kind of estimated with all my equipment. I put $125,000 in, 150,000 actually in for improvements to the facility, blah, 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 right? So I'm gonna go back to forecast. And I'm gonna go down through, back to financing and it matches up because I went with 250, right? So my, my, my SBA 7A loan startup was 250, and this is when I receive it, which I put before I start the business, of course, because I need to start paying for some supplies and get my inventory in. So if I open in June, I probably should make sure I've got the loan and my milestones and my process done in March, if possible, April at the latest for me to get moving forward with it. So again, pencil, anytime in blue, I can make modifications. So I'm gonna put in my 7A loan. I just put this one in, SBA 7A, probably it's a loan guarantee for the bank. And I just said that. So before the plans start, and how much do you owe as a start date? 250, how many payments? I put in 10 years for this, maybe seven years, depending upon what the bank's requirement or the policy, but I put 10, I put 5% in, which it may be higher, maybe six, just depending upon your risk level, your credit score, everything else. So again, a lot of variables going to that. So I hit save and close, right? So what I'm looking at is this will show me my payments per year, my monthly payment. If I look at it, it's 2,600 bucks a month. So if I'm doing, if I'm doing uh, $10 per person, my math is I need to, generate 260, right? 260 clients at 10 bucks just to make sure that I'm paying back the note, right? With that calculation with that. So 
that math's pretty straightforward there. It also will give me a running balance of where I'm at overall as I'm paying it. If I go to the yearly, 209, 187, 164, right? There are a few more details that I can do with this, like interest only for a while. It's just some modifications that I need to make with that. So again, looking at, at it overall from the financing perspective, pretty straightforward. So when I do go back to my profit and loss, remember I went to the top here? It does show me where I'm at for net profit per year. Not a lot, but I'm doing that, right? I'm getting it there. And then it also shows me early on that I've, I'm down a little bit because I have to make that first payment. I need to generate a little more cash. That's again, why working capital is important up front or interest only for the first few months to help get that cash flow going. So, with that. so overall with this that we built, um, we have 2%, two, 2%, two, 2%, two percent, two percent, three percent, super conservative with this overall for this coffee shop net profit. I, Brian Young will appreciate this. I'm paying myself, Brian, out of this. So I'm not, not paying myself, but I'm sticking with this and making sure that I'm supporting, you know, family, whatever else, making sure I'm, all my debts retired with that. So again, looking at it overall uh, with that. Now, one, I know we got short time here, but the benchmarks, I put the, so you can click on benchmarks, industry benchmarks. I can change this. You can search for an industry, which I typed in 722515, which is right up here. I already did this, but I can search for it. And it's what it's snacking at non alcoholic beverage bars. That's the number coffee shops, uh, ice cream, frozen yogurt, popcorn. It's non alcoholic. It's be, it would even be like smoothies. Um, whatever else, so it's selected. So let me go back here. So this would give me my gross margin. My forecast is third, uh, the benchmark is 68%. So I got to figure out how my benchmark can be better or do some comparisons with it, right? This is just a macro level, like a report card to see how you're doing when you're building this, right? Um, overall cash metrics, productivity metrics. Some of this is pretty intense, but Again, if I'm looking at the benchmarks, I'm looking at this profitability. How do you compare to the rest of the industry with that? Okay. So you can do that as well. That would be something when we go through the full class, we would go through, you know, there'd be one-on-ones. This The next class in uh, January 12th, there'll be a class a week off to meet with SBDC to go through it, hour, hour and a half. Next class, next week, again, meet with SBDC. So it's a 10-week class, five class periods five meet with Brian Young who just popped up there. That's what we'd be working at. So, or Harry or whoever else is selected, myself, whatever it might be. So that's what we'd be looking at. Um, okay, so I'm gonna leave this on the forecast. I'm gonna go back to PowerPoint. And go through a couple of things. You can print off you can print off just the forecast, not the entire plan. I printed it off today um, for high voltage and it came out to be, it's a lot, but it does it all for you. 23 pages, it'll break down revenue, direct costs. I mean, you'll look, Mia won't even need to look at this. She'll just say, wow, this looks so good. We're just gonna fund this. I'm kidding. Um, but really looking at balance sheet, cash flow projections, revenue, personnel per year. Personnel is the same thing, we can look at that. But again, looking at it from overall perspective, we can print that off. The other thing, there's some other tools. You can, you can do multiple scenarios, and I'll show you that at the end, and the milestones which we talked about. And then I'll answer any questions. But let me show you real quick, because I think last time this was, it might have been missed. Well, somebody else that asked me the question. You can see it again, correct? Thumbs up, anybody? Yep, yep, great, thanks. So you can do multiple forecasts. So remember I talked about Nia gets the one that's conservative, that makes a lot of sense, that you may want to be aggressive. So what you can do is click this button under scenario. See how I have an aggressive forecast there? I can put aggressive forecast or I can create a new scenario. 
and I can copy over the existing scenario, right? So I don't have to do all that data input again. I can do some modifications with it, but I don't have to type in everything else. So I've already got another scenario built. So we've got that. The last thing is, um, let me go to options. I can also go to the resources. The sample plan library is right here. Under options, you can click on that. And there are a ton of different plans historically that have been put together. Oh, no coffee shops. What is the that? Uh, I know, because they, they probably expect me to know everything about it, I guess. I'm just being funny. But, I saw one more coffee shop again. Oh, you did? And there's like a bakery, there's a bakery one, right? I just typed in bakery one, clicked on it, kind of gave you some basic backgrounds of what's going on, just some samples. I don't know that I would use that all the time, but it's um, just some things to look at. It gives you different sections, financials, appendix, management summary. That's a full plan right there. So to look at that. So again, that's where the plan's at. So with that, with that being said, I'm going to go back here to the forecast. Right there is where you click down, download and print. You click download and print to print off your financials. Take a look at them. You can select what you want to include. I, I select everything. That's why I was 23 pages. And I click download as a PDF. It'll churn for about a minute. And then I'll show you the magic here. Open the PDF. And there's my, there's my financials that I have. So my revenue, direct costs, my personnel are all, all on those charts. I know this probably won't be the best business plan that Ms. Ms. Rock has seen, but I'm going to say it's probably the top 50, 25, maybe. It's outstanding. Just, yeah, so it's just really good tools for people. And, and um, I think it's awesome for people that aren't super into the financials because you're not stuck with the spreadsheet. You're stuck with answering questions. And the better you can answer those questions, the better product you'll have. So again, looking at that. So with that said, being said, I'll, I'm going to transition here to, whoops. Go through any questions that you folks may have for me. Um, thoughts? I, I contact have a quick information. Question. I yeah, do sure. have a quick question, Brian. Uh, I noticed that the version that you of Life Plan that you shared with us, or at least with me, doesn't have the benchmark tab. Any reason for that? Huh. I will look and make sure that you should have that. Oh, okay. It should be up there. Yeah, you should have the full. You should have the full version. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, bet. And this has been great. I don't know the rest of the team here, but uh, this is a lot of great information here. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'll look at that and make sure the, the full version. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, you can, you can um, submit those to us via chat, ask us, or if you want to follow up with Brian and myself later, I know I'm a little bit past, but... Um, be more than happy to answer anything for you right now if I can. Uh, Brian, this is Clay speaking. Yeah, Clay. Um, I, I I was happy that you exp you exposed me to the sample library. Um, but I wanted to know if if uh, is there like a can I can I begin by using resources on on the website? Uh, Hector shared some insight as well, but I just wanted to know uh, coming from you, like, is there any way that you would point me in the right direction to? start to dig and you know get some some greater insights because i mean like uh i know what i want to do um brian young actually uh uh led me to the water in regard to um doing some research on trademarks and intellectual property which is super important for where i'm going to take take my business's direction 
Um, but yeah, like I, 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 I'm willing to do the homework. I just don't want to pick up the wrong books. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go in the library and just be stuck in the kindergarten section when I should be in law and, <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Great so, question. Yeah, that's for sure. I'll see what we can dig up. Brian and I will talk about like maybe some other things for you, you know, and that's where like, even if you just did the bet, the milestones right now in the plan of what you need to accomplish for your list, trademarks, copyrights, the whole thing would be toward the top, right? Understanding that whole process to make sure you have a good feel for that. And then maybe you can find somebody, you know, that a lot of times that you're looking for to organize the business, how our structure may be, I mean, Mr. Play, Haynes, LLC, whatever you want to call it, um, you get that thing set up too as far as the structure with that before you get into developing the full, you know, full financials because you've got exactly. some things to take care of first, right? So that's where that milestone portion would really be helpful for you, for sure. Yeah, right. And don't, yeah, because that way it takes it from here and all the things you need to do, your task list and puts it in that list for you, for sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thoughts are things, and I want to make this thing work. Sure. Thank you. Um, Anybody else? I, yeah, I just want to say this is awesome information. It's a lot all at once. And what's really great is that we have the recording, and so we can go back and, and look at live plan and then also listen to the recording and you know, play around with it and put our own numbers in, our own projections, and then also connect with the um, York SBDC um, advisor. So I, I'm just really excited about the possibilities for all of us, really, all of us entrepreneurs that are on the line, on the, on the line, on the so, webinar. So Julia, what's your favorite video game? My favorite video game? Yeah. I don't play video games, but my favorite game is Words with Friends. Okay. So you get better at it after you start using it more or doing it more, right? Yes, yes, yes. I would say the yes. same thing with this software. The more that you go in and you can make mistakes and you can go back and delete stuff, the more that you get into it, the more comfortable you're going to get. I can tell you from experience, when I first started using this, the more that I, the more that I worked with it and asked, asked the hard questions and tried to figure some stuff out, the better I got with it, you know, I really, and I, I've been using it since 2013 and I'm still learning a few things about it. So I think getting into it and not being afraid, it's not going to destroy the, it's cloud-based, it's not going to happen to it. And if you, something does happen crazy, call us up and we'll get you another, another seat in there. So then, no big deal. So just using it. I thought you were going to say like Mario Kart or something. I mean, I don't play any of those games, but I'm just like, you know, I'm old school. So no. Where's okay. with friends? I see Hector um, smiles. So maybe he's got something else that he plays. It's like super game. I don't know. But, yeah, but it's, it's, anything that you invest time in, you get better and better at it. And yep. if you're not as, you know, the numbers aren't, at least for me, I know the numbers can be intimidating and, you know, just knowing that there's tools and resources and people that can kind of help me through the challenge is exciting in itself. I, I just know I have to put the time and the energy right. in to make it happen. One thing, uh, uh, when you're online, uh, they have all, uh, online advisors too. You can call a, you can call Live Plan directly, and they have people there who can you know you because it happened to me. I was stuck, so I would call the Live Plan advisor, and then uh, they would walk me through the exercise. So it's very, uh, I mean, it's very uh, uh, friendly user, user. I mean, you know, it's easy to deal with. Yeah. And they're usually back to you within a day at, at the most. Usually if you do a chat, they're pretty quick. If it's an email, maybe at 30, 24 hours. But usually they're back in the, you have a question you've got. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Anybody else? Yeah, Brian. I can vouch for their customer service because I had a problem signing up for my account. And the advice I got was to pay for it and they'll fix it on their end. 
and um, reimburse me. And that's exactly what they did in less than two hours. And I started putting mine together. I'm freaked out, I'm overjoyed, but I'm freaked out again. But it's a good exercise and it's challenging me to think beyond what's in front of me. Sure, that's, well, it also, it also, you have to answer some questions yourself or get some other technical assistance, right? So again, you know what you're up, you know what you're up against, I guess, so to speak. Are you, I, I need to ask, I did work a little bit with the, I think it was eight greater New York City. I can't think of the exact, I'm, I apologize. That's How okay. Was, it, was that, who was that? Was that you and that? Yeah, that was me. I go through I, Pace, Pace I, um, it's DC. I was totally impressed with your first attempt of going through that. I was telling Brian Young that before the meeting tonight. I was like, or today we had a call at four. And I said, I was totally impressed with you folks because you even went into the financials, you know, not doing it. And you had a really good first attempt. I was pretty, I was really impressed with that. So great job on that. Kudos to you. Thanks. Hence why I said I was freaked out, overjoyed, and then back to be freaked out again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Just. I just have a quick question. In the plan section on live plan, where it says comments, is that something that the advisor will be commenting on or ourselves? That's for the advisor. So the advisor can comment on that, okay. like myself, or if we invite Brian in or Oswaldo, Harry, whoever. So they can make comments in your plan with that as you make them. A lot of times what will happen, I'll have it set up where as soon as you make comments, I'll know how many comments you've made or how many uh, updates you've made. And I can make comments like, Couple couple times a week, or as soon as I can, to get them back to you uh, with that. And the pitch proposal, you can't make comments. So, like with Annette, what I did is I had to send an email back to her with a list of comments back with that, or on the financials. But usually in the plan section, when it says comments, that's where we can input data. I can put hyperlinks. I can put things to additional data in there for you too. So, great question. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Well, I, I want to thank everybody for being attentive. I know it's not an easy uh, subject. I know Julia said it's a lot of fire. I said early on a fire hose, but it's a lot of information. Um, just know that you got a great group of support people here to help you. That's why we're doing this. We really want to help people, higher financial literacy, get you comfortable with it. I can tell you this. I'm an econ guy. I studied economics for you know six years and going through the process, but did I really get into like balance sheets and all that? Nope. I did later and I, I learned about it and I was kind of hesitant, but I got into it. I'm a, I'm a testimonial for that. Like just getting experience with it, you get more confident with it. So anyway, with that, so thanks again for, for all your attention and great questions tonight. I, I really appreciate all those. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Thank you. And I want to thank your college. I want to thank you, Brian and, and, Brian and Harry for such a wonderful presentation and really good content. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Endless gratitude. You all have the best night you can. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Until the next time.